Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. It's good to be back on the air. It's been a little while, and I feel honored by, to have my co-host today, Joe, uh, Joan Wilshire. And uh, my special guest today is going to be Sue Abderholden from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And who's your guest going to be today, Joe? I have a fantastic um, guest with me today, Roberta Opheim. She is the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities Ombudsman for the state of Minnesota. Sounds great. And so... We'll have that and a few other things coming up next on Disability Viewpoints. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. It's been a little while since we've been on the air. Glad to be back. It's an honor. With me today is my special guest, Sue Abderholden from the National Alliance on Mental Illness here in the Twin Cities. Welcome, Hello. Sue. Thanks for having me, Mark. Hey, you're welcome and uh, glad to have you on. And one of the questions we want to ask is, how has uh, COVID-19 changed uh, the folks with or people with mental illness? Uh, how have their lives really changed, first of all? Well, I think what we've seen is that everyone's mental health has been impacted. So we're all living with great uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future, how long we'll have to be at home or wear masks. You have people who um, are worried about catching COVID-19 because of their age, their underlying health care condition, or if they're an essential employee. You have people who are alone and are feeling very isolated. You have families that are together 24-7, which can be a little bit too much. Um, you also have people worrying about their jobs and loss of income. And the one thing we haven't really talked very much about is that people are experiencing grief. So you have you know, teens that don't have their prom or their graduation or college students that don't have graduation. You have weddings that are postponed. Uh, people can't even attend funerals. And so all of those things lead to kind of that ambiguous loss, which leads to grief. So I think everyone's kind of struggling right now with anxiety and depression. So uh, the next question we wanna ask is uh, legislatively, there's been a lot of uh, things going on even though we were really ha had a the regular legislative session, but it was short for some of us because we weren't able to really be at the state office building or Senate or Capitol. Can you tell us what's going on, for example, NAMI as far as legislative things that's, that affect mental health? Well, most of our stuff is still waiting, um, and we're hoping that it'll be brought up during the special session. So. Yeah, um, a lot good. of our work, we had uh, worked for three years to update the Commitment Act. Um, all of that is the Senate bill that didn't get voted off the House floor before midnight um, a couple of weeks ago, the last night of session. There were also um, things in there related to youth assertive community treatment teams and to um, changes to our children's residential treatment programs. So there were a lot of really important things in that bill that we are just waiting for. Um, the other thing that isn't talked about very much are the waivers that have been put right. into place because of the emergency order. And one of the biggest things for the mental health community is that you can finally get therapy by phone. Most people with a very serious mental illness do not have a computer, do not have a laptop, do not have an iPad. They don't have any way to do telehealth. And so the phone has been really important. And what they've seen is that it has worked really pretty well for a lot of people. And the no-show rates are down, people are connected. Um, some families of children find it more helpful. Um, but I, I will say that what we've seen because of telehealth and having to move totally in that direction is the disparities um, in our state in terms of we have people who don't even have phones, people who don't have enough minutes on their phones to do therapy by phone, you know, unreliable internet connection. All of, all of those kinds of things can really um, 
make it difficult to access mental health care. The, the one, and I, I'd be for the telehealth, I think, it's, I think it's good, but the one question I'd have is how accurate do you think that is as far as diagnoses or, or you know, because in a, in a real emergency case, you have to still go to the doctor or go to the, you know, and so how, how accurate do you think telehealth really is? You know, I think it is pretty accurate. Um, you know, even before COVID-19 hit, a lot of mental health services, particularly psychiatry in greater Minnesota, was delivered through telehealth because we have a shortage of psychiatrists. Um, and it, you know, would you rather it be in person? I think for most people, yes. But when you have a lot of barriers in terms of transportation right. and things like that, it, um, it actually worked out okay. Right. Well, good. I And uh, that may be uh, our future coming up is more telehealth then. And, Absolutely. And uh, what, I, you've seen a lot in your years at NAMI. Um, what, what, have, what do you think has been the biggest improvements and what do you see coming ahead? Well, I would say probably um, the biggest improvement is really the development of our community-based mental mm -hmm. health system, mm -hmm. in-home care, supportive housing, you know, uh, schooling to mental health, mobile mental health crisis teams. I think those are all important. Right. And, um, you know, I like to say that our mental health system isn't broken. It was never built. And so what we've seen <laughs> is kind of that foundation Very good. being built. Yeah. We, we still have a long ways to go. And, you know, one of the things that I want to say, Mark, is that um, changes to our criminal justice system because of Mr. Floyd's murder is really important. A lot of people right. who are killed by police actually have a mental illness. And so we are certainly um, an ally in this effort and we are pushing for better police training, uh, better use of mobile crisis teams, changes to the 911 system, um, all of those kinds of things to try to make sure this doesn't happen in the future. Yeah, and I, I don't, sometimes in mental health, I don't think you can ever give enough education because every case is special. And there, there's a little more mental health going on, I think, now. And the, the one issue that I th see coming up ahead is the affordable housing for mental health. And I think that's a big issue. I think it's something that still needs to be worked on. There are a lot of things that need to be worked on, but especially that one. Can you want to? I would totally agree, yeah. If, if you look at the frequent utilizers of emergency rooms and police interaction, Generally, there are people who don't have housing, who have unstable housing. So that is that would be a you know it's a it's a real solution instead of just keep bringing people to jail or to the ER. Well, yeah, that's true, very true. Um, how do you think legislatively the legislators really look at COVID nineteen versus mental health? I think there's a lot of work that can be done, still needs to be done. But how how do you think that has been intercepted? Well, I'm hoping the legislature keeps some of these waivers in place um, so that we can continue to do, you know, services by phone um, in particular. Um, I do think that because of COVID-19, there is greater awareness about how things impact your mental health. So people who thought they were mentally healthy before now really understand the impact of isolation and that kind of constant anxiety and the high stress and the real impact that that can have on your mental health. And I think that's a good thing for people to really kind of raise their awareness and recognition of that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think there's a lot of uh, ways this can be marketed. I think the whole picture needs to be looked at. Um, you know, any, for anybody who has just uh, had an issue with mental health, what would you recommend and what advice would you give them? Well, if you're struggling with your mental health, you definitely want to reach out. Um, we do encourage people to um, talk with their primary care physician first to make sure it's not some other type of healthcare condition that's impacting you. Um, but then, you know, call your insurance company, find out who's in your network. So you make sure that you're going to an in-network therapist, but start there. And these days you can go on the internet and you can see kind of the type of practice that someone does, the, their kind of area of focus so that you can make sure you're lining up with the right person. You might want to specify that you want someone who is, you know, a woman or a man or someone who focuses on LGBTQ issues or someone who's your same race. So you really want to kind of research that and make sure. But I'd also encourage you to look at the resources that NAMI has on its website, namimn.org, 
Um, we have. Want to say that again for the, if somebody didn't have a sure. pencil. It's uh, NAMI, N A M I M N for Minnesota.org. And do you have an 800 number by chance? Um, you know, these days, most people don't care about the 800 numbers because okay. you don't get charged those long distance numbers. So, um, so our phone number is 651-645-2948. Okay. Um, but we have peer led support groups. We have a lot of free online classes right now um, that people can reach out to. But if you're really, really struggling, um, you can text MN for Minnesota to 741-741-247 and someone will reach out and help you. Great, great. Is there something that you'd like to cover? Uh, we got about three minutes left or so. Well, one thing I wanna say that, um, and I think it's really important that um, we all need to be addressing racism. Um, racism actually negatively impacts people's mental health. Yeah. Right? right, because you have not just these big things that happen, the murder of Mr. Floyd, um, but also those microaggressions, the discrimination, this day in and day out. Um, and, and I think that as a, as a community, as a society, we need to really start addressing that so that we have, um, so that we're, we're not negatively hurting people um, like we have been. Yeah. And the impact of COVID-19, you can look at every state across the nation and you will see that African-Americans are impacted more um, even based on the proportion of the population um, than others. And so, you know, these are issues we really need to address. I think that whether you live in Minnesota or any other state, and we do, uh, there's been so many things that are going on with COVID-19 and then the Floyd issue that Minnesota just, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening. The isolations, mm -hmm. the mental illness, the COVID-19, and it's a real load for people. And I think that Minnesota overall has done very, very well. Mm -hmm. That the Minnesota people have really band together and uh, tried to help each other. I mean, uh, uh, you can't help the protests that are going on, but overall, if people needed groceries, people were there to help them and mm -hmm. things like that. And I think that's really what Minnesota is all about. And I, I just think yeah. that people have handled it overall pretty well. There's things that can be done, but overall it's been pretty good. So in our last couple minutes, I wanna give you the final thought, but I do wanna say, Susan, that you have testified down in the House and Senate as much or more than I have. Carol Evan has covered you well and done a great job over there for you. And you may not realize it, but I'm, your, I'm one of your fans in the back row of the <laughs> hearing rooms. If you're testifying, I'm usually there. If I'm not, I'm in the building, but I just want to thank you and commend you for the real job that you've done and let you uh, expound on what you've done and what you're trying to do if you want to. Well, thanks for those kind words, Mark. I appreciate it. I mean, the only thing I would say is during this difficult time is for people to control what you can, which includes turning off the news so you're not listening to it all the time. If you're worried about someone, reach in because if you're feeling depressed, you're not going to reach out really be mindful of, you know, nutrition and moving in some way. So you get the endorphins going in your brain. And then I always like to end it with grace and space. We don't always do our best when we're under this kind of extreme stress. And so give people grace and space. I, we we got, yeah, so much. great. We got about a minute left and I wholeheartedly want to thank you for all you're doing and let you know, again, you've got a real fan here and keep up your good work. I know we're all supposed to get around to retiring, but I'm not going to. And if you do, that's your option, but uh, you've done a great job and you're really the voice for Minnesota when it comes to mental illness. And thanks much. Well, thanks so much for having me on again, Mark. And thanks for your many years of doing this show. I think it's an important and valuable asset. To well, we'd, we'd like it to continue and, and we hope it does. And if I have anything to say about it, it will. So uh, there you go. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the staff I have behind me and Joanne Urbis who really puts us together. So. Uh, and she's not here today, but I'm sure she'll hear this. So we'll be good. Again, right. Sue, thanks for being on here. And, and uh, we'll have you on again. So you just raise your hand whenever you want to get on here and we'll do it. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Take care, Sue. We'll see you again. Okay. Bye now. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. 
My name is Joan Wilshire, and I'll be your co-host for this segment. Well, much of the um, attention related to COVID-19 impact is on the vulnerable population. It's really been focused on um, long-term care facilities and the seniors. We know people with disabilities are not at all experiencing um, the same types of things. And so the pandemic is out there and we really wanted to take this opportunity to talk about how it is impacting people with disabilities. With me today is Roberta Opine. She is the Minnesota State Ombudsperson for Developmental Disabilities and Mental Health. Welcome, Roberta. Thank you, Joan. Well, Thank you for having me today. it's always a pleasure to have you on board here, Roberta. And there are probably more questions than answers here, and I'm not sure how we're going to do this because usually we do a great question and answer segment, and and this is really tough with this pandemic, isn't it? The pandemic has really um, thrown the service industry into disarray. While long-term care facilities most people are familiar with or assisted living, many of the individuals that we serve live in group homes of four or five people living in the home. Uh, some homes have less than that, but it is still uh, a mini type of congregate setting, or they live in intermediate care facilities for developmentally disabled. And um, what we're seeing are rules, conditions, ideas um, that are all over the map. Right. What's the um, biggest takeaway here um, that's been the most impacted um, for um, folks living in group homes in res residential settings? For those who are living in group homes who do not have COVID, you know, they're, they're under the same stay-at-home order or were mm -hmm. prior to the governor releasing it um, as everyone else. And there were several of us that worked with the Department of Human Services to attempt to provide guidance to ensure that people's rights were protected. And our fundamental mission on that was to say that people with disabilities should not be restricted or have their rights restricted any more than you and I, mm -hmm. which of course would mean the stay at home order said we should stay at home and we should wear masks. But you could go out to go to the grocery store. You could go out to go to the pharmacy. In some cases, we had people who have jobs and the essential workforce. And we had group homes saying, you can't go to your job, which put their job at risk. And, um, and yet, you or I, if we were essential workers, could continue to work right. in our facilities. So we worked very hard to um, educate providers of group homes about the rights, but we're still seeing um, a tremendous amount of conflict. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like um, individual residents that are living in group homes in residential settings are being, um, you have access to getting tested? Um, they haven't, well, with them staying at home, most of them were not having access to testing, unless of course they or someone in the facility um, was suspected to have COVID. Sure. They're now, as I understand it, um, trying to extend the testing beyond the nursing homes and beyond the drive-through test centers and go into these group homes and congregate settings. But I don't know that, you know, to what level or to what extent they've been successful in, in doing that. Well, and it seems like, um, trying to track data on what percentage of people with disabilities are being impacted by COVID. That seems rather a challenge these days to um, it determine. Is. The Department of Health is collecting an awful lot of data, but the data uh, that they're reporting out, you know, is primarily for nursing homes, and then they talk about the age of the people that, um, but people with developmental disabilities the, the biggest concern would be if they have an underlying condition like diabetes or heart condition, right. then they'd be in the same kinds of levels of risk that's, that a non-disabled person would be. Right. But they often do have multiple co-occurring sure. disorders, both physical and, and otherwise. And um, so they are at risk. They are considered 
vulnerable adults, not just mm -hmm. on a normal basis, but certainly during the pandemic. Exactly, right. Um, you know, as we're moving forward with um, much of um, the COVID and the pandemic, do you think there needs to be more funding directed towards perhaps moving um, folks out of these setting, group settings um, so they may be not as risk? Um, you know, think about the individuals who are in prison and in our jail systems. Um, I think that um, when COVID is done and we all sit down and say, what did we learn from this? Um, I think we will have a lot of recommendations, including that if someone can live in an independent setting with services coming to them, that in fact, that's a goal that we have, that's a long-term goal in the state of Minnesota is for people to have their own place, their own apartment, their own home, maybe with a roommate, maybe not, and, um, and then have the services brought to them, including and up to people who might need 24 hour a day service, sure. which sometimes happens in the group home, but they should have a right to live in a group home if they choose, but live independently if they choose. So I think that what I've learned through the pandemic is we want to push that and escalate it before we're in this situation again. Right. Now, another um, factor we've all heard for anyone with or without a disability, when you do have to go into the hospital because you're um, condition with the virus has gotten worse. Um, you're not allowed to have a family member or friends or uh, personal care attendant, anyone be with you. That has got to really be hitting hard home for the, uh, individuals. It, it's a, a big problem and we've been talking with the health department and others and I think there's been some modification in some of the hospitals, but you're right. We first learned of it when a staff member's mother fell and needed immediate surgery, not due to COVID, but because of a fracture. And all she could do was drop her mother off at the emergency room. She wasn't allowed to go in. Her mother was deaf. And so she's standing out in the driveway negotiating how they're gonna communicate with her mother. And, um, you know, fortunately, there are many types of sign language interpreters. There's video and, and all of that. So they were able to do that. But as I thought about that, in the context of people with developmental or intellectual disabilities mm -hmm. of any kind, you know, how much do they understand? Can they accurately communicate their illness, their symptoms, what's going on with them? And it would be important for uh, a caregiver might be a parent, mm -hmm. might be a guardian, it might be the people who uh, work in the group home, but to go in with them, number one, so they're not afraid, two, to be able to communicate sure. what's happening to them and help communicate symptoms and other things that the facility would know, but that the hospital would not know unless someone told them. Well, it, it just, that just seems like so much sense, but it hasn't um, taken place yet, though. Some facilities have allowed it, others have not. Okay. Some have allowed family members in more to visit at the very end of life, and others haven't. Sure. So you really don't know um, when you go to your local hospital mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. their conditions will be, sure. but generally, no. You drop someone off at the emergency room or at the hospital, you leave them at the door and you don't see them until they I know, come back out. It's just a horribly scary situation. Well, what type of um, complaints have you, uh, concerns that have you received in your office regarding the pandemic and COVID-19 in particular? The most serious of all complaints is that if people go out to their jobs mm -hmm. or go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, the facility is saying, you can't come back in. Wow. And they may be discharged from the home, even though the governor has said people shouldn't be evicted from their homes uh, during the pandemic. Now, the dilemma here is they say, but we're a group home provider, we're not a landlord lease. Although the federal government has indicated that the contract between the person and the facility or the county and the facility should be treated like landlord-tenant law. So right. 
um, the Department of Human Services, when they did waivers, did not waive any significant rights of the clients. Mm -hmm. So that means the rule says if you're going to discharge someone, you have to give them 60 days notice. Well, COVID, their COVID disease will be over in 60 days. Correct, right. We did have one that was in a treatment program, went out for a walk with a group. Some people were arguing in the group, so she walked home a different way than the rest of the group. And she was immediately discharged from the facility to basically be homeless. Now this is someone with a disability being told they can't come back in the house. That's horrible. And she wasn't even able to pick up her stuff for at least another day or two. So um, in that case, the county had to work very quickly to find sure. some sort of housing um, given the vulnerability of the mm -hmm. individual. Great. Well, what type of um, resources would you suggest people um, use or contact right now if they're in a residential setting and they have concerns? Um, the, they should contact whoever they use for advocacy. Of course, the Ombudsman's Office is always um, open and ready to mm -hmm. discuss these items with them. But, um, you know, there are other groups like ARC or NAMI or others that may be able to help too. But the primary uh, recommendation for some of the questions is the health department. They're the ones who can tell you what the risk factors are, what the dangers are, and how you should handle them. Sure. What we believe is required in a group home is that if somebody gets symptoms, don't know if they have COVID or not, you should isolate them the way I might isolate in a different room sure. in right. my family home. And then, you know, of course, get them tested and, and see whether exactly. they need to be hospitalized or whether they can go through this okay. in their own home. Well, that's um, good news um, that we've got some good resources. Um, and I think we just have to continue down this unknown path and do what we can to stay safe and healthy. Again, thanks, Roberta, for coming in. Thank you and for having me. chatting with us about this very serious pandemic. And we shall get through this, but we've got to be safe and work together. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Great. Well, uh, we want to thank Sue Abderholden from the National Alliance on Mental Illness for being on our show today. And uh, I want to thank Joan Wilshire for all her hard work and being here today. I think that we're going to be back on the air now for a while, so we've got a lot of good things coming up. Uh, next, I think we're going to see a little something on the Americans with Disabilities Act coming up uh, next time. And uh, so we hope you'll, you'll watch us and stay tuned. And thanks, Joan, for being here today. Your guest was great. Yep, Roberta is always um, great to have on board and I think we got some really good answers and some ideas of what we should be doing during this pandemic for people with disabilities. Sounds great. Well, and also I think before we go, we're going to have uh, segments on COVID coming up that'll be in place of the legislative update is what I'm planning on. We'll try to make that work, but it's an important issue and I think until we get a Absolutely. vaccine and things settle down, we're going to have to take a good look at it. So again, on behalf of Joan Wilshire, Joe Orbis, and the entire team, thanks for watching Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. We'll see you real soon. Bye for now.